So our first um, items that we want to talk about are just the itinerary for today. So initially, we're going to go over some some overview, some some 10,000 foot view of account security. What are our overall goals here? Um, you know, what's kind of the point um, of all of this? And then we'll get into some items about how to do that, protecting your password, um, you know, strengthening your password, and we'll give you some tips um, on, on how to do that. Multi-factor authentication, sometimes called two-factor authentication. So we'll get into this in a more detail as well, um, but it's another layer of security, um, you know, when logging into your accounts. Uh, technical controls and administrative controls. So we're going to go into a, a couple different um, you know, types of measures that you can take in protecting your data, uh, technical controls being, you know, settings, um, something that you can enforce upon your staff, uh, encryption, permission limitations, things of that nature. Whereas administrative controls on the flip side, you know, it'd be something like a, an education tool or a training tool, um, you know, to share with your staff to better educate them, um, best practices, if you will. And then we'll tie all that sort of in a summary um, into how to manage some of these items actually in your own track ops. Um, and so, you know, it kind of brings me a point today, you know, the, some of these measures that we're going to be talking about, you know, aren't just applied to track ops. You should be applying some of these uh, items to all of your accounts, all of your business applications, your email, things of that nature. Um, but at the end here, we will tie it in um, to some items that you can do in track ops. And then I would ask that you guys, um, I'm sure you have questions. Um, you know, throughout the entire uh, presentation here. So I just ask that you drop them there in the chat box on the GoToMeeting control panel. Um, and at the end, um, I'll go ahead and, and uh, go through each one of them and, and answer them for you. So jumping into the overview of the account security. So what is account security, right? So we're, we're ultimately, you know, our overlying goal here is to protect our data from unauthorized individuals. Uh, malicious people, unauthorized people accessing our data, viewing our data, extracting that data, compromising our passwords. That, that's what we're trying to stop here. Uh, that's our overlying goal here. And education is the number one safeguard. So, you know, when we're talking about, you know, how to protect our data, well, we, we need to know how, right? We need to be educated on, you know, the best practices on do that, the, the tools available to us. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, where we get the webinar here is we want to share, um, you know, the things, the, our knowledge that we know um, to better help you protect your data, not only with track ops, but with all your other applications as well. And how do we do that? Well, we're going to we're going to share a combination of technical and administrative techniques. Um, I kind of touched on it a little bit um, and we'll get into more details of each of those um, here shortly. Regularly reviewing your account security measures. So. You know, after today, um, you know, today's a great um, opportunity to maybe learn some new things, uh, maybe um, review some of the measures that you have already in place um, in, in your business. Um, but it's important to, you know, continuously review those, you know, biannual or at least annually, um, you know, review, you know, uh, uh, you know conduct an audit to see, um, you know, who, you know, the measures that you have in place, who's adhering to them, um, the, how, their efficacy, um, and then anything that's new coming out, right? New things come out all the time. So it's really important to continuously educate yourself on the latest and greatest, if you will. Because our ultimate goal is to avoid data breaches, right? We don't, we don't want these unauthorized individuals coming into our accounts, looking at our data, um, extracting data, and using it against us, right? So that, that's what we want to avoid. And so really one of the, the major aspects here um, is protecting your password. Um, and really it's strengthening your password, you know, how strong is the password. Um, and not just with track ops, but across all your applications. And so the first aspect that I want to share with you guys is that your password should not be predictable. Um, you see it pretty often people use um, dictionary terms, common words. Um, these are easily predicted um, by uh, you know, hackers or, or bots across the the web looking to compromise um, your password. So if it's an easy common word or, or if it's even, you know, your name or your wife's name or it's your anniversary date or your, uh, your children's birthday or children's name, you know, these are all sort of identifying, easily um, identifiable uh, pieces of information about you that are predictable 
Um, so you don't want your password to be predictable. You should also not use it more than once. So this is very, very common. Um, I think the statistic is like 80% of people use uh, the uh, one the same password across multiple accounts, um, and and that's a huge vulnerability. Um, and basically, if you use the same password, let's say for you know track ops and your email and Facebook, and you know for some reason there's a data breach and Facebook, you know millions of users their their login credentials are are, are compromised. I mean this recently happened, um, and, and in doing so. You know the individuals that you know stole the, that those credentials and then can use them across other applications and the, and they'll attempt to do it. it's called credential stuffing um, and they'll actually use those um, you know credentials that they found and they will try and you know log in or use them to access other accounts and so if you're if Facebook gets hacked and your uh, username and password um, is compromised and you use that same password and track ops then it's possible that they could use that password and gain access to your track ops account. So always use differing uh, passwords, never use the same password once. Um, and sort of the, on an individual password level, um, you know, the strength of that password um, is ultimately determined by its entropy. And, and really the main component of a password's entropy is its length. And so it used to be kind of the school of thought that you know, if you had this complex password, it doesn't really matter how long it is as long as there's a number of different characters in it. Well, it's not necessarily true anymore. Um, a six character password versus a 12 character password um, is a huge difference. Um, and so I think by default, you know, your passwords and track also may come out at eight. Um, but I would encourage you, um, you know, to, to lengthen that to 12 at least. Uh, my ultimate suggestion would be somewhere in the ballpark of 20. Um, but 12 is a, a a greater leap, a much stronger length than eight, um, which is pretty common what you see. And so length is really the most important aspect in your in your password strength. And then of course there's you know sort of a secondary um, uh, aspect to the the password entropy um, is the complexity. I mean you don't want to have 20 ones. You don't have one 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 is your password, right? I mean you want to have at least some um, complexity to the password. Um, but length um, is, is the most important thing here. Don't share it with others. And, and so this is um, seems common, but you know, every once in a while, I have someone you know send me their password. Um, don't do that. Don't share it with anyone. Don't email it. Don't text it. Um, don't put it in a TrackOps support ticket. Um, and don't do it with your other applications. Um, TrackOps will never ask for your your password, and your other applications should not be asking for your password either. Um, it should be private to you. Um, and you should never share it, even across uh, an email or, or even a support ticket. Um, understanding email phishing. So, uh, you know, this is a, more, a bigger, you know, hot topic these days. Um, you know, there's tons of phishing schemes out there where, um, you know, these bots will send you these emails and you think that, you know, they came from a trusted source, but it's really hidden behind um, you know, they're, they're pretending them pretending to be someone else, and, and really the uh, one example that I have uh, would be your bank. Like oftentimes you'll see, you know, an email come over from Wells Fargo. Um, it looks like it came from Wells Fargo, and there'll be links inside that email, and you think, oh, okay, this is my bank. I'm going to open this email and click these links. Well, the links in actuality are going to another website, um, and so it's always important to confirm the identity. You know of the person sending you the email before clicking any links or opening any attachments in that email um, you know often your email service may have a, a phishing filter it may have uh, you know a mechanism that puts these phishing emails in spam but it's not 100 percent perfect sometimes these phishing emails will get through and so it's vital you know that when you get an email and you're unsure um, exactly where it came from um, to, to not click any of the links, not open the attachments, um, and vet the email before, before moving forward in, in it. Properly storing passwords. So something I see very often, uh, especially when I'm doing a screen share um, with a client, um, oftentimes, you know, they'll go, they'll open up their browser, you know, click their track ops, uh, bookmark, and their, their uh, username and password automatically populate for them. Um, and that's because they're storing them on the browser. Um, and I highly suggest not doing that. And, and the reason being is that, you know, let's say, you, you know, someone, you know, 
get your laptop, they go on your computer, you know, uh, uh, you know, unauthorized individual, and all they have to do is open the browser and your password automatically populates for them. So it's basically not having a password at all. Um, and so they don't need to know your password. They don't need to look to try and uh, compromise the password. You know, you're basically giving them your password for you. Um, so it's highly recommended you don't store it on the browser. And instead, I would suggest using a password manager. Um, there are a few. There are a few out there. One password, LastPass. Um, we use one password here um, in our in our company, and so um, it, it's a really great tool to help you um, manage all your passwords. And, and how it works is that the password manager itself it, it operates kind of like a vault, right? And so you have access to that vault through a password. Right, so you have one main password that you know to the vault, and by accessing that vault, you then access all the other passwords across all of your other accounts. Um, and even, um, you know, one password, they even allow you to generate unique long passwords on each of your accounts. And so you don't need to necessarily remember all those passwords because what you need is just the password to the vault. And that password should not be predictable. Um, it should be long and at least have some complexity, and it should not be used on any of your other applications, right? So you have one password that's strong that you use to gain access to the vault, which is your password manager. And then once you get inside that vault, you have access to all of your other passwords. Um, so it's, it works in the same sort of, um, you know, storing passwords, if you will, um, but it, it does them in a much more secure manner. So give that a look, one password, I highly recommend it. Um, and the last thing that I want to talk to you about your, uh, protecting your password is adhering to your client requirements. Um, sometimes your clients have uh, maybe outlandish even to you, maybe they seem o overkill um, the requirements when it comes to um, your passwords and, and your staff passwords and things of that nature. Just go ahead and adhere to those requirements. Um, it's always good to you know accommodate your clients. Obviously we want business. Right. And um, and so if they have a requirement, um, you know, go ahead and fulfill that requirement for them. And once you do that, you can then, you know, uh, with potential clients, you could say, hey, um, you know, when you uh, when you send us to your sensitive data, you know, these are the steps that we take with, you know, protecting that data. This is the steps that we require our staff to take when protecting your data. So it's more of like almost an advertising tool at that point, because. You know, chances are if they're, you're competing with another business and that business doesn't take their data as seriously as yours, you, you might come out on top, um, you know, just because of that one aspect. Multi-factor authentication. So a really great tool. I uh, want to spend a little time on this because, um, you know, we here feel that multi-factor authentication is should be a requirement, really, um, for not only you, uh, but all of your staff. Um, and basically what it is, uh, sometimes referred to as two-factor authentication, but um, what it is is basically the concept is that you have something that you know, um, which would be, you know, your username and password to gain access to your account, and then something that you have or something that you own, which would be your mobile device. And so how it works is that you actually connect your, um, or, you know, you link your uh, mobile device, your own personal mobile device, to your account. So you can use, like, your TrackOps account, for instance. Um, and in doing so, when you go to log in to your TrackOps account, you know, you fill out your username and password. And when you get that successfully entered, the uh, TrackOps will then ask for a unique um, code. And your phone that is linked to your TrackOps account will produce that code, uh, oftentimes in a, via text message. And it's a unique um, code, you know, six, seven, eight digits, something like that. And, you know, it depends on the application. And they send you that code. And you then, you know, via your phone, you then input that code from your phone um, onto your TrackOps account. So without your phone, without the device that you own, you would not be able to gain access to your account. So let's say, you know, for some reason, your TrackOps password is compromised and that person takes your credentials and they go to their own laptop, their own computer, um, and they try and log into your track ops. Well, they have your username and password and they successfully entered that. Well, if you don't have MFA enabled, then they can just log in with your username and password and now they're in. If you do have MFA enabled, then the track ops will initiate multi-factor and you will have the, your phone will produce a code 
and you will not be able to gain access to your account without your own device. And so the person who stole your, your username and password, you know, doesn't have your phone as well. So they can't log in to TrackOps. Um, so it's a great safety net um, in the event that you do have your username and password uh, compromised, um, that the person who did that still won't be able to gain access to your account. Um, and this is not just for track ops. Um, you can use MFA across almost any application. And I would even say that, uh, you know, if you use a particular business application and it does not support MFA, then I would reach out to the support team and request that it would. I, I believe it's that important. Um, and sort of to, to follow that enforcement, right? This is a back to, you know, your security protocols are determined by, you know, the weakest link. And so if you have 10 administrators, and only nine of them have MFA enabled, and that 10th one gets his credentials stolen, and he doesn't have MFA enabled, then it doesn't even matter that the other nine have MFA, um, because you are as strong as your weakest link, and the person who stole that, those credentials is now in your track ops taking your data. And so enforcement um, is important. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later in the terms of a company policy or a compliance policy. Um, but it is something you know I feel that strongly about. Um, uh, so look into that. Make sure you're enabling it. Make sure all your staff are enabling it um, because it can protect you. <clears throat> so now that we've you know kind of bolstered our, our passwords and, and and implemented MFA across our accounts, we're ready to turn our attention to you know what we call technical controls. And these controls um, are something that you can enforce upon your staff. So it's a setting or a configuration within the application, um, or it's uh, an encryption or a uh, permission limitation. It's something that you know you put, um, you enact in the system, and your staff have have uh, no choice but to adhere to it. Um, so the first item we want to talk about is requiring encryption at rest. Uh, and really what we mean by that is encrypting your data at rest. Um, and data at rest is really any data um, that is stored on a device. So it could be your laptop, um, your desktop computer, um, your mobile device, your phone, or your tablet. So all of these things contain data at rest. And so what you can do is you can actually encrypt um, the drives on those, on those particular devices. And uh, the scenario I wanna share with you um, you know, kind of is the reason why you would want to do that. Um, and that's if, you know, if, let's say that on your desktop computer, um, you know, you have hard drives, et cetera, and someone breaks into your office and takes those hard drives. They literally, you know, lift them out of the computer. Um, and they take those hard drives and they go back to their, um, you know, computer and they install the hard drive on their computer. And if that hard drive is not encrypted, then they can just gain access to the hard drive as if it was on their own computer, because now it is. Whereas if you actually encrypt that hard drive, then when that person takes the hard drive out of your computer and sticks it into their own computer, the information inside that hard drive is garbled without the encryption key. And so because they don't have the encryption key as well, they can't gain access to the data in that hard drive. And so it's a, an extra layer um, of protection um, in the event that, you know, something, you know, catastrophic happens like that um, and you're, you know, you actually have drives taken out of your, out of your computers. Um, I will share with you that by default, um, iPhones, um, iPads, your Android phone, even the newest Android phones, they're all encrypted by default. Um, so data on your iPhone is already encrypted. Um, with a Mac computer and a Windows computer, the encryption process is fairly simple. Um, you know, when you set up your Mac computer, um, I believe the, the module within a Mac computer is called the file vault. Um, and you can simply just enable encryption on your hard drive. Um, same with Windows computers. When you set those up, um, I believe it's called BitLocker. Um, but that mechanism, that module within the Windows computer, you can just, you know, basically check a box to encrypt the hard drive. It, you don't need to be a program or anything like that. It's fairly simple to do. Um, and so highly recommend looking into that. Automating software updates. So what we mean by software updates is really the operating software um, on your computers, on your uh, you know iPhones, things of that nature, Androids. Um, it's good to keep those, at least the operating system, to automatically update as soon as it becomes available. 
Um, and the reason being is that, you know, oftentimes there's, uh, you know, new security patches, new updates to the security software in, in the device um, that without it could leave you vulnerable. Um, and if you don't automate the update, you could miss it, or maybe one of your staff could miss it. Um, and if they could, they might go a week, two weeks without this update and, you know, malicious bots, um, you know, people out there looking to take your data, they're looking for, you know, vulnerabilities like this. So it's good, good practice um, to keep those automated. Enforce remote wipeable devices. So uh, on an iPhone, for instance, uh, there's a mechanism, a, a tool in the phone called Find My iPhone, right? So in the event that, you know, the iPhone's stolen or you lose it and it's never going to be recovered, um, you can enact this Find My iPhone. And part of Find My iPhone is what it's called a remote wipe. And you can perform that remote wipe and it will essentially reset the device and it will, um, you know, uh, erase all of the data that's been stored on there, pictures and things of that nature. And so it's important, um, you know, to enforce these kind of things to make sure that, you know, your staff people are operating and they have uh, something like remote wipe enabled because if they do lose their phone, okay, yeah, that's bad, but we can do some damage control items like remote wipe. Um, configuring quick device locking, so pretty straightforward um, on your phones, on your computers, you have the ability to lock your screens. Um, it, it's important to enable that so that, you know, in the event that you put your phone down, someone takes it or you step away from your computer and someone comes in behind you, um, that the screen locks and without a password, um, you won't be able to gain access to that device. Avoiding public free email services. So I kind of want to spend a little time on this um, and what we mean by free email services. We're talking about Google, Gmail, um, Yahoo, things of that nature. Um, and, and this is more, you know, sort of a suggestion, right? Um, and, and it's not to say that free email services are less secure because they're not. They're just as secure as your company controlled email. But there are uh, really basically two things that we want to pay attention to when it comes to free email services and, and sort of reasons why we might want to avoid them. Um, and one of them is that email providers like Yahoo and, 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 and Gmail the, these uh, free email services, they will lift information out of your email um, to basically bolster their ad campaign. So they're trying to improve their ad algorithms to send you ads based on things that you know, you're looking to buy or that you're interested in. Um, and they improve that algorithm by lifting keywords you know, out of your email. Um, so it's not necessarily malicious. Um, but if it is, you know, really sensitive information, your clients maybe have this a requirement of, of some nature. Um, but technically, the free email service is, you know, quote unquote, reading your email. Um, so if that is a concern, um, it's 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 a good idea to avoid free email services. The second one is that you don't really have any control over the over the free email w with your employees. So if your employees, if everyone's using Gmail. Uh, you know, you don't have any control over the security measures that your employees are taking with Gmail. So like, for instance, multi-factor authentication. You can't be sure that, you know, through their free email that your staff people are actually using MFA. There isn't a way for you as, you know, uh, because you're not the administrator, um, it's not possible for you to enforce it or even make sure that they have it enabled. Um, whereas, you know, a company controlled email, you are the administrator and you can determine whether they're using MFA and enforce that on your, on your staff people. And, and really, uh, you know, sort of, sort of, uh, um, you know, complete that is that email is really your, one of your most sensitive applications. It's one of your most important applications because through email, you're able to reset your passwords for all your other applications. So if someone is able to get into your email, then in theory, they could reset the password across all of your applications, including track ops. And that is power. And, you, and that is something that you want to avoid at all costs. And the same goes for your staff people, too. You know, if, they, if someone gets into their email and resets their track ops password, then they're able to log in to track ops. And it's your data breach as, you know, the manager, pre owner of the company. Right. So it's, it's on you. Um, and so it, the data in track ops um, is now compromised. It doesn't even matter where it came from at that point. Um, so, 
you know, sort of uh, to comp uh, finish that thought, um, you know, free email services, consider avoiding them. Minimizing email content. Uh, so what we mean by this is mostly uh, like personal identifying information, social security numbers, um, credit card information. Um, you should really avoid at all costs, you know, uh, sending this kind of information in an email or at least minimizing it, um, including case updates from track ops, right? Um, and instead, um, you know, consider links, right? So instead of, you know, filling out a credit card form and sending it as an attachment or, you know, something of that nature, um, even if it's a sensitive document, consider a link. Um, track ops actually allows you to generate expiring links um, on your files on a case. Um, and so instead of you sending out a physical attachment, a sensitive file to an email that you don't control and you don't really know what happens when it goes in that email, because once you send it to that guy's email, now it's behind his security. And if his security is lacking, then someone could find that attachment. So instead consider an expiring link, because if you create a link and that link expires in 24 hours, then in 24 hours, even if someone gains access to that email maliciously, that link is no longer useful and they can't get the attachment. So instead of the attachment just kind of being out there in the email ether, it's behind an expiring link. And at some point, you know, designated by you, that link will expire and no one, you know, you won't be able to gain access to the attachment from that link. Um, some of your clients may, you know, require that you uh, send physical attachments. Um, and so, you know, that's fine, basically. You know, I would say just use your best judgment um, if you can get away with just using the links, which is, uh, you know, definitely safer. Um, do that um, if, it's a, if it's a, you know, make or break kind of thing. Um, like I said before, use your best judgment. And, and then finally here, restricting track ops permissions when possible. So, you know, in track ops, um, you know, you, every user is given a user role and that dictates their permissions. So. I would say, you know, be sure to err on the side of caution. Uh, make sure you're giving the least amount of permissions possible um, for the individual to be able to, con to to work his job, to be able to conduct his work. Um, and so uh, kind of going based off the job title is a, is a good rule of thumb. Um, but what, what I would say is that, you know, in the event that let's say, um, you know, you give uh, your investigators the ability to view non-active cases, right? So when, um, you know, someone logs in, they're able to see, you know, what we call closed cases or non-active. Well, if you remove that permission and let's say that that investigator, you know, his uh, credentials are compromised, they log into the system. If they don't, you know, once they log in with that guy's, you know, username and password, um, then he, they're you know logged in as him and they have his permissions. So if they have permissions to view non-active cases, then there's tons of historical data that they'll be able to access. But if you remove that permission, you know because if your investigators don't need to be accessing all these old cases and you remove that permission, then when the unauthorized unauthorized user gains access to the system under that person's credentials, they also cannot view non-active cases. So just by limiting that permission. Um, you've eliminated the ability for someone to view, you know, potentially hundreds of backlogged cases. Um, and if you're the particular individual we're talking about doesn't need to be accessing all these old cases, then, you know, err on the side of caution, give them the least amount of permissions they need to do their job um, and, 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 and disable that permission. So now we talked a little bit about our technical controls. Uh, I wanted to get into our administrative controls. Um, and these uh, differ um, with your technical controls in that administrative controls are, are trainings or edu piece, you know, pieces of education um, that you share with your staff to better help manage um, protecting their data, right? It's a best practice. Uh, it's not something that you can enforce. Um, you're not necessarily getting rid of the threat. You're not eliminating the threat but you're changing the mindset of the staffer to, you know, uh, you know, be cautious against the threat, right? To understand that the threat exists and how to avoid it. So you're not necessarily eliminating the threat, but you're helping the staffer um, avoid it by educating him. Um, and so a few of these um, items we wanna go over, one of them is prohibiting public Wi-Fi access. 
Um, so in today's environment, uh, you know, there's public Wi-Fi everywhere, right? The, at your, your Starbucks, your libraries, their hotspots for free Wi-Fi anywhere. Um, and we highly suggest um, avoiding uh, accessing those Wi-Fi points. And the reason being is that you just don't know who else is on that Wi-Fi. You don't know who else is on the network. And there's a particular attack. It's called man in the middle attack. And, and it's basically an eavesdropping uh, method in, in which where the, the unauthorized individual, the, you know, the malicious um, hacker, if you will, on, on the Wi-Fi that you're connecting to, the public Wi-Fi, can sort of intercept your communication. Um, and so if you go and you log on, um, to your track ops account, you log in your email and you're on a public Wi-Fi and there's someone intercepting your keystrokes, um, then they can potentially gain your password. They may, they could, you know, quote unquote eavesdrop um, on you, you know, working on your computer on that public Wi-Fi. So um, highly recommend not, not, accessing, and not accessing public Wi-Fi where you can. Um, instead, I would suggest um, tethering your phone. Um, you know, most phones now have the ability to create their own their own hotspot. So if you're desperate to get on Wi-Fi on your laptop, tether it to your phone instead. Avoiding public and shared devices, uh, sort of a, a coupled with the public Wi-Fi, um, is that you know on a public device, you know at your library or whatever, um, you don't know who's been on that device. You don't know who's accessed that device before you or who's going to come in behind you. Um, and so it's possible that someone came in there before you installed a key logger, and when you go and you try and sign in your email, your QuickBooks, or whatever, they're able to lift that the, the, your keystrokes and they identify what your password is. Um, and so you just you don't know who's on it. Um, so if you do access a public device, uh, you know don't don't log in into any of your sensitive accounts or anything like that. Um, and if you have if you need to log in, don't use the public device. Don't allow for removable media. So what we mean by removable media would be like flash drives, CD-ROMs, things of that nature. Um, just, you know, don't allow people to put sensitive information on those items and, you know, leave with them out of the office because, you know, there's not, there's very little protection um, with, you know, for instance, a flash drive, right? So if, you know, if you lose that flash drive, you can't remote wipe the flash drive. You can't change your password to gain access to the flash drive. The, the documents that are on the flash drive are now in the possession of whoever, um, you know, recovered that flash drive, stole the flash drive, and now you know, there's no way for you to, you know, perform any kind of damage control to minimize, you know, what they can and can't do now that they have that drive. Um, and this kind of couples with uh, paper, right? So printing, um, you know, sensitive information, documents, um, you know, you'd probably want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, you just, you don't know if maybe you left it on the copier in the office and someone else is able to look at it. Maybe you left it or dropped it at the Kinko's, maybe you just lose it um, and someone can easily pick it up. And, and again, like flash drives, like CDs, you know, you, you, there's no remote wipe ability, right? Once the day, once they have that piece of paper, they have it and that's it. Um, you can't do any damage control to prevent, uh, you know, any further um, you know, issues. Um, and so, you know, part of that is, is communication, right? Communication is key across all things. Um, and so if you are a staff member and you, your password is compromised and people are accessing your track ops account, you know, um, you know, uh, maliciously, or, you know, you do lose your phone or, you know, you do lose your laptop or something like that. Be sure to tell someone. The faster you tell someone, the faster something can be done about it. Passwords can be changed. Um, you know, re remote wipes can be done. And so, you know, if something, you know, it's bad if you do lose your phone, but don't keep it to yourself. Make sure you inform someone so that, you know, they can help you with, you know, remote wiping the data on that phone or changing your passwords and things of that nature. So using company compliance policies to document understanding. So all this con all this stuff, all these training, all these education tools, these best practices that we're sharing with our staff, um, all that can kind of be wrapped up and documented through what we call a compliance policy. And TrackOps actually has a module called compliance policy, and you, and you can upload these items into your TrackOps account, which your staff people can then access, download, execute, and upload back into TrackOps. Uh, but essentially, it's an agreement 
right? So you you give a training, you give a mobile device policy training um, and how to operate in the field, best practices, um, enabling remote wipe, things of that nature. And to sort of document their understanding, um, you then have them execute a, comp a compliance policy so that they are you know, acknowledging that, okay, we did receive this training, we do understand it, we understand that you know, having remote wipe as a function on our phone is a requirement by our company, and without it, we're in breach of that policy. And so you know, in the event that there is a major data breach and you do have you know, data leaking out of your system, you know, it's not just complete negligence on your part, um, instead of more, it's a breach of policy, um, which is a, you know, probably more advantageous. So um, being able to document this understanding can be a, a great tool um, in sort of, you know, uh, enforcing um, these best practices and making sure that these best practices are being implemented by the staff because they are required, you know, from the company for the staff to be working uh, you know, as they conduct business. And, you know, sort of to finish that is is continuously educating your staff members, right? So we kind of touched on that earlier, um, a recurring uh, training, something that, you know, a schedule where, you know, every year, every six months, you know, we're, we're revisiting um, these controls, these measures that we have in place. Are they effective? Who, who you know, if maybe we have new staff, that need to, you know, get up to speed on this these items. Maybe we have staff that have not executed our company policies, and so we can do an audit, we can do a review, um, and then we can, you know, educate our staff further and continuously educate them because, you know, things change, new features become available. Um, so staying on top of this stuff um, is important. Education is the number one safeguard. And so, you know, in summary, track ops, you know, through your security settings, your user security settings, you're able to do a few things um, to manage your account security, you know, within track ops. Um, and within the user security settings, you can enable multi-factor authentication. Um, so this is a global setting. So basically you enable it. So your staff can all then um, enable it, you know, on their own account. Um, so it's, it is important to note that, you know, your staff people, they will need to connect their own phone, you know, to their account. Um, but in, in your user security settings, you can enable it there. You can set a minimum password length. So we kind of uh, touched on, you know, the strength of your password is almost, you know, entirely made up on its length, right? So setting a minimum password length um, is a great tool. And so you could set it to 12 characters as opposed to eight, which I think it is by default. Um, and that's, you know, league beyond uh, just an eight, eight character password. Um, and just so you know, once you set that minimum password in track ops, it won't require everyone to change their password immediately if it's less than 12. Um, it'll be on the next instance when they actually change their password. And that kind of brings me to my next setting within your, your, your security settings and track ops, and that's requiring a password rotation. So sometimes this may even be required by your clients, uh, but you can set a, uh, a password rotation. Um, and so every 90 days, every 180 days, something like that, you can require that users update their password. Um, and you can kind of use that in conjunction with your password length. Um, so if you set a new password length, you can then set a new password rotation so that at some point, everyone updates their password to the new length. Um, within your reports, there's a nifty uh, audit report called the Security Checkup Report. Um, and there's a few things that this will give you, and I highly recommend um, going into your reports and track ops and checking it out because it is often an overlooked report that I think is pretty valuable. Um, but the, the first thing it'll share with you are, are stale accounts. So accounts that you know haven't been accessed in over a certain period of time, I believe it's uh, uh, six months. So if, a, so if a account hasn't been accessed um, in more than six months, it'll it'll flag it and it'll tell you, okay, this particular maybe client user or or vendor investigator that we haven't used in a long time, they haven't accessed track ops. And so, what we recommend is you disable those accounts. So if if you you know if you lose a client for or obviously, obviously, or if you uh, you know lose an investigator if they you know he's fired or he quits, our recommendation would be to delete that user. 
but if they are an act, you know, they are available, you know, to be, uh, you know, to work a case in the future, but they just haven't logged in in a long time, uh, we recommend disabling them so that, you know, their their account just isn't open, uh, you know, as of as a vulnerability. Um, it'll give you accounts with stale passwords. So any account that hasn't updated their password in over 12 months, um, it'll give you those uh, those users. Um, it'll give you accounts with free email services. So if you do at some point say, okay, we're not going to use free email services anymore, then you can go in, you know, into this report and see, okay, what client users, what staffers are using free email services. Um, it'll show you accounts without MFA enabled. So this is a really great one, especially if, you know, after today or even now you have a, you know, a, a policy where, you know, MFA is required um, or if it, maybe it's part of a part of your IT policy or something along those lines where you require MFA and track ops and all across all of your accounts where well, you can look in here and see which users have not enabled MFA and then it'll allow you to, you know, um, take action and, and, and go to those employees and say, okay, let's set this up for you. Um, it'll show you accounts with access to system settings. So I'd say system editing system settings is one of the highest permissions in track ops. Um, it should be given with caution. Um, and so this will at least allow you to see, okay, who has permission to edit settings. Uh, maybe we need to audit that and make sure we're only giving that to the, you know, the least amount of people possible. Um, and then for you, for those of you who use um, the API in track ops to connect to other third party applications, um, it will give you stale API tokens as well. Um, reviewing user roles to ensure least access. So again, um, you know, giving the least amount of permissions to a user for him to, you know, successfully perform his job. That's the overall goal here. And so it's good to review those, um, audit those, make sure that, you know, maybe if you do onboard a senior investigator, um, maybe someone that, you know, is more trustworthy, someone you want to give a particular permission to, don't be afraid to create a new user role. Um, to separate him from your your other investigators or maybe your junior investigators, um, and so you know regularly reviewing those um, to ensure least access is, is good practice. And then managing your compliance policies and procedures. So I kind of touched on that a little bit, um, you know, in in the administrative control section. But you know, company policy, um, you know, documenting the understanding of a training. You know, you give a training on how these staff members should be operating with their mobile devices in the field. You can then, you know, finish that, you know, couple that with a, a policy that your staff people then execute and sign and agree to. Um, in track ops, you can uh, manage all those. There's a, um, a compliance audit report, and you can see across all of your policies that you upload in the track ops, you know, who's executed them, who's uploaded an executed document, and who hasn't. Um, and so new employees, obviously, um, you're probably going to want to pay attention to that, making sure that they're up to date on the trainings and that they're, you know, signing these policies, uh, you know, moving forward.